Father, we thank you so much that uh, you pursued us, that you go hard after us, that you left your home in glory to come down and to experience humanity for the sake of bringing those who were far from God near to God. Father, when we think about the multitude of things that, for which we've been forgiven, we're, we're just amazed. And we're amazed that a God like you, the creator and sustainer of everything that is, would chase hard after us for relationship. That you'd be willing to sacrifice your own son so that you would not lose us. We are grateful and humbled in Christ's name. Amen. I love that song. Uh, it's a new song, uh, Hillsong United. There's a few words in the song that just kind of capture your heart. And there's a theme that runs concurrent through the song. It talks about God chasing us down. It talks about Christ being abandoned in the darkness so that we can step into the light. It talks about if he left the grave, so will you and I. And if he surrendered, then that's the kind of life we will live. And if he gave his life for us, then we'll give our lives for others. As a matter of fact, all through the Bible, all through the Bible now, you see this theme of where God is willing to do whatever it takes without the violation of your freedom to pursue you, to get you into a relationship with him. Even if it means allowing some things in your life that you put your trust in to just fall apart so that you come to the end of yourself. He's so intent on a relationship with you that oftentimes... What you interpret as God's abandonment is God's presence. I'm trying to get you to open your eyes and to see the way you're going is not working. And if you'll just turn your heart toward home, then everything that you're looking for, all those places of satisfaction and contentment, they're all going to be found in Him. Now, I want you to do something this weekend. You've got to do this quickly. I want to give you two themes here. I want to give you two pictures to look at. And the first is... A huge tower and when you look at a huge tower you're thinking of something that is tall and intimidating somewhat exclusive right towers are tall intimidating somewhat exclusive then on the other picture I want you to look at a table a table is it's smaller lower to the ground and it's it's inclusive and inviting so you got a tower tall exclusive uh, intimidating you got a table smaller it can be wide but it's inclusive, it's inviting. Now here's the reality of what I'm about to show you in the scripture. Every person in the room has either a table or a tower mentality. It's how you live. Now, if you've got the wrong mentality, it's very difficult for you to admit it. That's part of the mentality that you have. But Jesus talks again and again and again that individuals and corporate uh, organizations Nobody's immune. Lay people, uh, pastors, teachers, everyone. No one's immune to this. You either live your life with a table mentality or a tower mentality. What I want to do in the next few minutes is help you decide which one you are, and then in deciding that you would have the courage, if you're in the wrong one, and there is a right and wrong one, that you'd go to the right one. Okay? So let's deal first of all, what is the table mentality? Two passages of Scripture this weekend. Luke chapter 14 where Jesus illustrates a major component of the kingdom of God is the call to go out and invite people. And then we'll get to the other passage later, tower people in Genesis 11. So here we go. Luke 14, Jesus says this. Let me, let me kind of summarize it for you, and then I'll get to the passage on the screen. Basically, God sends his servant out to tell people the banquet is ready. This is the coolest banquet you could ever attend. It's got everything your heart desires. So he sends his servant, go out and invite people in, tell them it's the great banquet, the great dinner is ready, Go out, compel them to come in, let's get this thing started. And so they start making excuses. And they're really ridiculous excuses. One guy says, you know, I can't come right now because I just bought a field and I got to go and see it. Think about that. You don't buy a field before you see it. You see it, then you buy it. Second guy says, you know what? Uh, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I got to go test them. It's like when you say, I just bought a car, I got to go test drive it. <laughs> you test drive it before you buy it. The third one I get, I don't fully understand it, but the guy says, I just got married so I can't come. That's another sermon probably. <laughs> Whatever happened, it happened. I don't even want to touch that. But the servant comes in and the owner who is God is angry. And then God looks to the servant and says, okay, if that's the way they're going to have it, 
Go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the servant says to him, well, what, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master, who represents God, remember, told the servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. So here's what we know about God already. He's the owner, and he's not going to be happy until every seat around the table is filled. And he's so frustrated with empty chairs that he tells them, go out and compel whoever, wherever, highways, byways, the streets, the alleys, you know, the difficult districts, go out and compel them. Have you ever begged anybody for anything? All right. You know that there's a, there's a sense of uh, urgency, isn't there? It amazes me that this language is used by Christ himself. Go out, beg them, compel them. This is what they're looking for and they won't see it. Do whatever you have to do. The problem is the tendency is this, especially of tower people that we'll get to in a moment. The tendency is to settle down, not to go out, to, uh, to just drop anchor and say, this is good, this is enough right here. I, this is a control safe environment. I like this. But all through the Old Testament, God kept saying, go, be fruitful and multiply. Easiest command God ever gave, be fruitful and multiply. Easiest one to obey, isn't it? Come on. I can do that. You want me to do that? Oh, sure, I can do that. Honey, but God said, be fruitful and multiply. I'm just obeying God. Go out, expand, don't settle down, don't stop, go. God was so intent on this that when the Babylonians came in and took the Israelites into captivity, there was a false prophet by the name of Hananiah. And he tells the people of God, hey, let's stay out here on the Kabar Canal and not move into those heathen territories of the city of Babylon. Don't move into the city, he said. We're believers and they're not. Babylon is the source of pagan culture, so have nothing to do with Babylon or its people. And a matter of fact, Hanani, the false prophet, says, stay out, pray against the city, pray that God will bring destruction. What does a prayer meeting like that look like? You know, God, we pray that you would drop a bomb on Babylon. God, by your grace and mercy, send a plague and destroy these people. Think about that. That's what Hanani is saying. Jeremiah gets wind of it. He says, whoa, wait a second. This is not God. The true prophet of God, who's still living back in Jerusalem, or Judah rather, he writes them a letter, and the letter's recorded. He says, this is the revealed word of God for people who feel like they're living in exile. Okay, time out. Do you feel like you're living in exile? Stay with me, we'll build on this. You, you ever feel like, okay, it's a week gone by, you've gone to the movies, you've watched television, you've listened to the news, true news and fake news. <laughs> And do you ever have a time in your life where you think, you know what, I've had enough of this. I'm going to go build me a shed somewhere in Montana and get away from these crazy people. They don't stand for my values. It's a rat race. They're chasing things I don't chase. They're pursuing things I don't pursue. Man, I'm out of here. I'm going to work this out. I'm going to go to Montana, live in a shed somewhere with maybe a horse and a couple of dogs. That's it. And you know what God would say to you? Don't do it. Not the call on your life. That's not what you're supposed to do. Jeremiah says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. To all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so they too will have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because as it prospers, you too will prosper. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Wow. This would have been unbelievably counterintuitive to the first people of God, just as it is to the second people of God, the church. God says to them, don't withdraw. Don't go to Montana and live in a shed. Permeate the city with salt and light. Go right in there. Now, don't assimilate. Don't become exactly like them. There's got to be a distinction in your life, but don't separate. Permeate the city. And whatever you do, don't wish destruction on it. Don't have a prayer meeting and say, God, people in L.A. are so heathen. Get them. <laughs> you know, cause a tidal wave to just wipe out the city, especially Hollywood, those evil people. Don't do that. God says, that's not, that's not my heart. He says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've called you or carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you will prosper. 
You forget that if God sends a tidal wave, you get wiped out too. After 9-11, I could not believe some of the Christian posters that I saw of where people were almost glad that people died. Really? Really? But my first question would be, well, if this is the judgment of God, why are you still breathing? I mean, if the judgment of God comes, we're all in trouble, right? And where's the sadness, man, of people hurting, people dying, people suffering? That's the heart of God. The overarching message is this. Now, stay with me. God possesses a table mentality. A table mentality, not a tower one. Now, the question is, you still with me? What's a table mentality? Let me help you with it. My mother was a southern woman. Man, she could lay out a southern spread like you would not believe. The feature item was always pinto beans. If you ever want to do something kind for your pastor, a pot of pinto beans will do just fine. And she would put this thing called half, uh, a fat back right in the middle of it. Not this kind of fat back. <laughs> this fat back. And it was, it's just a block of fat, you know. That's all it is. I mean, your arteries just pucker up. And she'd put this big piece of fat in the pinto beans. And then there was cornbread fried in a pan the way it ought to be, the way God intended. And then you'd have fried taters, which was a perfectly good vegetable that God had made, destroyed in Greece. <laughs> and then green beans. The thing I remember, though, my mom would spread this table out because we had the same meal probably four or five times a week because we weren't very wealthy. Pinto beans were cheap. But I remember Dad coming in home after work, and he would sit down, and if there was an empty seat around the table, he would immediately start to ask us, where are your friends? My dad grew up poor. We lived around a lot of poor people, and he couldn't understand why we wouldn't invite our friends to dinner. Now that my father had made it and we could afford good things, he was upset with us. He literally asked us, where are your friends? And start naming them, my friends first, because my parents loved me the most. <laughs> he would say, Jeff, where's JoJo? JoJo was my very best friend. JoJo Duggar, just down the street, we played wiffle ball together. Where's JoJo? Where's Tittle? Yes, that's a real name. I'm sorry. Where's Tittle? Where's Billy Joe Brown? Billy Joe Brown, real name. Where's, I grew up in Tennessee. Where's Billy Joe? My father would sit at the table, and I saw him the happiest when the table was full. My mother was the same way. She was a sanguine on steroids. She loved to be around people. They gave her energy. And when all of our little friends came in, and she had to take out the slats in the middle of the table, remember, make it larger... And then bring in the chairs from everywhere, the lawn chairs and the picnic table bench, so that we'd, if we ever had to move outside, she was elated. That, that was my parents. I tested them on this a few times. I said, okay, how far are you really willing to go to bring people to the table? So one day I invited Mo Riddle. That's her real name. Mo Riddle was the local clown, really. Mo Riddle was 45 years old. He had Down syndrome. Everybody in the neighborhood loved him. But you never knew what was going to happen when you invited him into your house. So I brought him in one day and just watched my mom and dad. They smiled. They were so happy. They gave Mo the head seat on the other side of the table. I never seen so much cutlery flying through the air for about an hour and a half. <laughs> Mo Riddle. One time I brought my friend Tittle. Tittle came from a very poor family. And every time I think about Tittle, I think of pig pen. Because he never liked to take a bath. Tittle just was, he had this aversion to water and soap. And so it would be months. So I said, I'm going to bring Tittle in because there would be a distinct smell. And let's see what my parents did. They brought him right in. Mom cleaned him up first and then put him right around the table. <laughs> These are my parents. Now, I got to tell you, sometimes I didn't want strangers around the table because I had to accommodate them. I had to be nice. I had to be on my best behavior. Uh, I really didn't want to share the apple pie and ice cream because we didn't have a lot. So there was a chance the more guests we had, by the time the box got to me, it'd be empty. Mom didn't seem to care. <laughs> Go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you've ordered has been done, but there's still room. The master said, then go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Who are people with a table mentality? I'll tell you what they are, who they are. They exhibit the heart of God. They continue to move out. They never settle in. They, they live to see a full table. They're disheartened, even frustrated, if they see any empty chairs around the table. And they're so frustrated that they have to go to the ends of the streets, the ends of the alleyways, 
the end of the work cubicle, the end of the earth to compel those who are far from God to come near. And it's not like table people are not smart. They're smart. They know it's going to be difficult. It's going to require energy. It's going to require sacrifice. They know that the ice cream box might come to them and it's empty, but they don't care. It's worth it. And at times it's, if you're a table person, incredibly inconvenient. Because when you have more people come in, there's going to be more dishes to do. It's going to take you longer to clean up. There's going to be more tension in the air as the new guest might say something that really offends you. He may say something like, Ronald Reagan was a loser. Or the Dodgers, I hope they lose every game. Or 80s music really sucks. (laughs) They may say things like that. And even use those words. But table people, they don't care. Because when the table is brimming all around with new people, it just brings them alive because they have the heart of God. Now, that's table people. Let's talk about tower people. Genesis 11. Here we go. Now, the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the earth. So let's talk about tower people. First thing about tower people. They're settlers. Look at verse 1 and 2. The whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Now, there's nothing wrong with settling unless God tells you not to. And if God says, don't settle, be fruitful and multiply, go out, increase, influence, permeate, expand, then that's what you're supposed to do. Now, here's the question. If God tells you to do that, what is it about settling that attracts people? What is it about tower people that you like so much? People who just build a tower, protective wall. Well, it's comfortable. You can dictate who gets in and who who gets out. And you can gather people who are like you into the tower. Build walls to keep everybody who's not outside. Here's the problem, though. Most of the time when you build a tower and you want to settle, it's because you want more control and you don't want surprises. But the reality is the opposite happens. Because do you know how much effort it takes to maintain a tower? When my my wife and I first moved, uh, we were looking for a house. Two years looking for houses. Two years. And it was a time when demand was high. So every time Robin would find a house that she liked, guess what happened? Somebody would move in and pay cash and buy it right from under us. She was getting ticked, and my wife never gets ticked. Well, other other than at me. But she was not happy. We found a place... Up on the 210, he got us out of L.A. County and high taxes. And I saw a look in her eyes, and I know it's a look I've seen in many young women. It's the look of settling. You know, the girl who dates and dates and dates and finally gives up on ever finding anybody good, so she just settles for a guy. Now, tell me something. When she settles for this guy, tell me the hard work isn't going to start after she gets married. See, by settling, you think you're in control now, but you're not. It controls you. Well, we got this house because Robin had had enough. And I'm telling you, this house is making a couple of serious efforts every year to kill me. (laughs) It's got more problems than you could ever imagine. The roof, I had to replace it. It needs a fence around the backyard. It's falling down. The wiring is old. The plumbing is old. I'm paying a dear price. What I thought I could control is controlling me. This is the thing about tower people that they don't get. They get so protective of their little philosophies and their little cliquish groups and their little things that they like so much that they build a tower too that they're just miserable people because they live in constant fear of change. And it takes a lot of energy to protect sacred cows like what food we serve, who gets a seat at the table, what kind of dinner music will we play, how warm or cold is the room, Where is my personal comfy chair? If I build a tower, I can just settle down and I think I'm in control, but you never are. You're miserable. Here's the second thing about tower people. Tower people are settlers. Tower people are exclusive. Look at verse 3. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They use brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Now again, what's wrong with building with bricks? Nothing unless God tells you to build with stone. Stones are God-made. Bricks are man-made. Think about bricks for a moment. Here's a brick wall. What do you notice about that brick wall? It's boring. All those bricks look the same. 
I mean, every brick is like the other brick with little variation. They're square. They're almost religious looking. Some of you will get that. Legalistic and dogmatic. It's, it's, it's lifeless. Now look at a stone wall. Lumps and bumps, knobbly and untidy, unpredictable, varied, sharp, smooth, abrasive, irritating. It, it's like a box of chocolates. You never really know what you're going to get. In short, it's exhilarating. Exhilarating. One of my favorite preachers is Mike Bro. Have you ever heard of him? When Mike Bro was the pastor at Southland Christian Church in Lexington, Kentucky, he did something one weekend. He dressed up as an old woman. I mean, put a dress on, put layers and layers of coat like a bag lady, like a homeless person, and a straw hat, and he pulled it down over his eyes and dark sunglasses, and he waited till the service started, and he was scheduled to preach that weekend. So he waited until the music started, and he started to walk in, and he took a seat right in the middle. As he made his way in, by the way, he said he made sure that he just was rank with odor. <laughs> As he walked in, people the entire way just looked at him like, why, why are you here? What are you doing here? And then when he walked across the middle aisle, the people who he was seated beside got up and moved. And then when it was time for the sermon, there was an awkward silence because nobody knew where Mike was. And after he thought time had been well served, he stood up. And he walked out the aisle, and he started walking up the stage. As he's walking, he's removing layers of clothing so that by the time he gets to the podium, everybody realizes it's Mike Bro. Can you imagine being the people who moved to the other chairs? He didn't say a word. Well, he did. He simply started to read from James 2, and it said this, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? The point of the passage is not about rich and poor. The point of the passage is favoritism of any kind, discrimination against anybody who's not like you. But this is what tower people do. This is what tower people do. They build their towers, and then they build these little edifices, not only at church, but at work, in their communities. They build a tower, and they see their neighbors as us and them. It's the kind of person that doesn't even know the names of his neighbors, never even greeted them, met them, never invited them over, sees them as far from God, and hopes they stay far from God and far from him. That's tower people. He goes to work. And he doesn't hang out with the heathens. My older brother went through a time in his life when he was incredibly religious, okay, dogmatic. And I noticed every time I would come home from furlough from Africa and I would have lunch with him, he always would eat by himself. I'd go to his workplace, hey, let's have lunch. I haven't seen you for a couple of years. And this happened time after time. And finally one day I said, man, why? why? You, you've been here how, 20 years now, the same job, and you eat by yourself. What's going on? And he looked at me and he said, well, they're Baptist. <laughs> you talk about exclusive. I wonder what he thinks about people who are not Christian. You can't even eat with a Baptist. This is the problem. The problem with all of us. Tower people are exclusive. They say keep out, and they tend to talk down. Ta table people are inclusive. They invite everybody in, and they tend to talk across. It's not that table people don't realize that when you invite everybody in, you never know who's going to show up. They could be Giants fans. <laughs> Worse yet, they could be Raiders fans. <laughs> they could be Democrats or Republicans. They could be people who like different music or different movies or different races. But things begin to come alive. Listen, this is the most important point I want to make here. Tower people live under the illusion that by building the tower, that is the best way to do life, when the reality is it's the worst place to do, the worst way to do life, and here's why. If you just surround yourself with people like you, you're robbing yourself of the joy and the spice of life. Every time I've lived in a different country, God has sent a family next door to open my 
eyes to different people, different cultures. I believe that God's done this on purpose because one day he knew that I'd be pastoring here. Look how diverse you are. I love it. I wish we were even more, but we're getting that way. I told you a few weeks ago, I don't want to be pastor of an all-white church. Not that I have anything against white people. I am one. (laughs) But heaven is diverse. Church should be diverse. And here we are. I... I know that in these different families and cultures, I, my life is so much more enriched. I, I would have spent my entire life eating meat and potatoes. Meat and potatoes and soup beans. They're great, but is that all there is? And then when I lived in Africa, the De Silva's moved in, an Indian family. And every Sunday afternoon after church, they would invite Robin and me over to their house, and they would lay out this huge table. They were a huge family of all Indian food. I couldn't spell it. I didn't know how to pronounce it. But man, was it good. I never knew the world had so many different spices. And we would watch Dynasty, what you call Dynasty, and Dallas, and just eat all afternoon. Then we moved to New Zealand, and our best friends, our next-door neighbors, were Iraqis. And this was during the Iraqi War. Didn't seem to bother us. We were best mates. Her name was Kalud, and she would cook something called baklava for me. Have you ever had baklava? If you haven't, then you've not lived. Baklava is what they give you when you go to heaven. It's the first entree. It's the plate. They just take some baklava. Here, have some baklava. She would make me these dishes with nuts and raisins. And again, I couldn't pronounce it or say it. I just know, man, keep it coming. I loved her. I miss her so much. <laughs> and then we moved here. And God recently has sent this great family called the Della Vegas into our lives. The Della Vega, interesting family. Here's the thing about the De La Vegas. They're from the Philippines. We invited them over for July 4th. I got home. I had to work some in the morning. There he was, Henry himself, cooking on the grill, my grill. <laughs> he was cooking. There were no hamburgers or hot dogs. It's the 4th of July. I'm an American. Where's my hamburger? At first, I was pretty disappointed until he brought these huge pork chops over that had spices on them that made it taste like baklava. (laughs) It was that good. It just tasted, it was so good. I think of all the spice of life that happens when you live outside the tower. Let me keep going on this. Just stay with me for a second. It'll all come out in the end. You know what my wife did for her 53rd birthday? Let me show you. We got video. What's wrong with her? That's what she did for her 53rd birthday. My son and my daughter took her surprise skydiving. She loved it. She said she had a hard time breathing at first, but she loved it. My son and daughter said, hey, do you want to go skydiving? I said, sure, I'll come right after my root canal. (laughs) No way, man, I'm doing that. My wife and I have nothing in common, zero. It's just the truth. I've said this before. But you know, I need her. Man, she's opened up a whole new world to me. Now, sometimes I don't go into that world. (laughs) I'll stay home and watch it on video. But she's opened a whole new world. Food, I mean, I can't imagine where I... I think today, had I not met this woman, I really do think today that I would be in East Tennessee somewhere at a church of about 200 people, nothing wrong with that, in the country, eating meat, potatoes, and pinto beans for the rest of my life. So God brings this woman into my life, and the whole world opens up. Marriage, here's the problem with tower people. If you surround yourself with people like you, you think that the Spirit of God is working in your life to conform you to the image of His Son, but chances are high that He's not. Because the thing about bricks is they they go smoothly together, but rocks with pointy edges rub up and there's friction and friction is the only way you'll ever be able to grow you can never grow into the person God wants you to become until you're around people who aren't like you and you're forced to learn patience and unconditional love and grace and mercy let me tell you marriage will do that for you I promise you (laughs) your identity can only be discovered by distinction 
You'll never know who you truly are if you're just around people like you all the time. But when there's all kinds of differences in diversity, then you'll know, hey, here's who I am. This is what sets me apart. This is what makes me unique. We've talked about this before, that the Greek word periosmos and the Greek word thlipsis are Greek words in the Bible translated pain. And both of those words have their history in taking off your shoes and stepping into the wine press and squeezing the grapes until the good stuff comes out. You've got you to be pressured. You've got to be thrown out of your comfort zone. You've got to be around people who aren't like you, people who don't vote like you, people who don't look like you, people who don't eat the things you eat. But the spice of life comes alive. Remember Ricky? Ricky passed away about three weeks ago, three, four. It's, actually, it's probably been a little bit longer than that now. Ricky was one of those guys, I always thought he looked just like Sam Elliott. Put a cowboy hat on him, man, he looks just like Sam Elliott. <laughs> Ricky was one of those guys, very tough life. Addictions, estrangement from his family, a period of homelessness, imprisonment. But because there was a table person who invited him to have a seat around the table, he met God. And everything changed. I mean everything. He wanted to make everything right. He reunited with his daughter. He worked around here and gave so much volunteer of his time. Just wanted to do, and he was so happy. But he was like a sharp stone. When you rub up against him, man, you might get cut. It's awkward. As a matter of fact, I, can I just confess something to you? Sometimes during the week when I'd come out of my office to go down and get a drink in the cafe or a, a sandwich, I'd peek around the corner to see if make sure Ricky wasn't there. Because <laughs> a conversation with Ricky wasn't just two minutes. It could last the rest of the day. <laughs> but he meant well. He, he, he saw me as his personal mentor and he wanted answers to questions about this God stuff. And sometimes he would tell me a story and I'd say, now Ricky, you know I'm the pastor here. There's probably not a story you should tell me but it's okay. Come around the table, have a seat. Tell me the stories, Rick. Tower people would never take in a guy like Ricky. And there are a lot of you in the room that are here because you met a table person. Before I move on to finish the last point, I have to hurry here. The sad thing is that you can not only build a tower as an individual, but you can build it as a corporation. Do you know that's why denominations exist? When you build a tower, you can build it to an ideology. And then you only want people around you that agree with your ideology, or your theology even, even though theology is a good thing. Some of my favorite people are Seventh-day Adventists. I find them very interesting. And I've had a lot of dealings with them. My favorite joke is a Seventh-day Adventist joke. It's about the guy who goes over to his neighbor when he finds his neighbor working on Saturday, the Sabbath. And he says to his neighbor, why are you working on Saturday? Don't you know this is the Sabbath? And his neighbor responds by saying, Jesus worked on the Sabbath. And the Seventh-day Adventist says, two wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> wow. When your theology excludes Jesus, you probably have a problem. <laughs> we had to rent their facility when I lived in New Zealand because they didn't need it on Sunday. They had all these buildings and properties, and our church was growing, so I went to the department heads, and I said, we'd like to rent your nice community center on Sunday because I know you don't use it on Sunday. I also knew they were small and they needed the money. I thought I was going in to just be grilled a little bit on what we were doing, what our vision was, but I sat with them for two and a half hours and they only had one question in mind and it was this. Do you agree with our point of view concerning the millennial? They wanted to know if I was pre-millennial, post-millennial, or millennial. And they kept asking me, do you believe Jesus is coming back soon? Because their view is you have to believe that Jesus is coming back really soon. And I felt if I answer this the wrong way, we're not going to get this building. <laughs> but i got to be honest, nobody really knows. If Jesus didn't know, I sure don't know. And so I said, I certainly hope so. And that was good enough, we got the building. <laughs> I certainly hope he does, but I don't know. Here's the thing about tower people. 
They come up with these ideologies like premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennialism, or Calvinism and Arminianism and other schisms that tend to divide. And although they're not bad in and of themselves, they just surround themselves with people. And let me tell you why they do it. Let me tell you why they do it. And I can say this because I've been there. They do it because even among their brothers and sisters in Christ, they need a feeling of superiority. And to them, it's important to gain their significance by believing something that you don't and thinking somehow they have the higher ground. And that's how you know the difference between tower people and table people. Tower people talk down to you. Table people talk across. But you know what the worst thing is about tower people? They separate themselves so far away from everybody else that they speak a language nobody understands. I call it a, the internal tower of the linguistic divide. It's when churches start using language that anybody who comes on the outside has no idea what you're talking about. Not that that's bad. It's only bad if you don't really care to explain it. If you ask some people on the outside what a love offering is, I asked somebody that and they said, it's a hug. (laughs) Think about it, love offering, a hug. Do you know what filling the spirit means? Yeah, it means you're hungover. (laughs) Not filling the spirits, filling the spirit. (laughs) Stephen Mahog, my associate, heard the message last night and he said, I want to go home and write something, I'll send it to you. And he wrote something, he's a very clever dude. Here's what he sent me. Imagine going to church and the pastor stands up and says, welcome to our sanctuary where the blessings of Yahweh and his hedge of protection will bless you like Jabez as we fellowship through stewardship, bringing our tithes into the storehouse for his glory as we celebrate the propitiatory sacrifice till the rapture when the lamb becomes the lion and restores the redeemed, justified, sanctified brethren. Selah, amen. <laughs> amen. Now, nothing wrong with any of that, but Imagine. Tower people create their own special language nobody else gets, and they don't care that nobody else gets it. The table people, they go out and they build up, build out rather, and they talk across and they major in the majors. They compel people not to an ideology or a favorite dogma, but to the one thing that matters the most, to Jesus Christ, the Son of God who takes away the sins of the world. So finally, let's let's finish this. Tower people are settlers, tower people are exclusive, and finally, tower people are all about making a name for themselves, right? Look what happens in verse 4 of tower people. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. I go to Zimbabwe, Africa quite often to do and visit the work we have there. There's a big church there, huge church, seats over 4,000 people, which is very rare in Africa. It's very modern, very expensive. In fact, the leaders of the church paid Robert Mugabe a $2 million bribe to be able to build it. And when you drive in, every 50 feet, there's a huge poster and sign, a picture of the pastor and his wife. So you pass like 20 signs. And you almost think as you're going that, whose church is this? (laughs) Dane Johnson once said to me, last time I checked, Jeff, it says Christ Church of the Valley on the sign out there, not Jeff's Church of the Valley. He's right. Towers, you know, you, know, you can always note, here's how you notice the difference between a tower leader and a table leader. A tower leader is unapproachable and intimidating. A table leader is approachable and inviting. So here's what I want to say to you. Will you help me build this table? And if you haven't gotten it yet, let me just run through these things. Towers are about your name. Tables are about one name. Towers are about your agenda for your life and your kingdom. Tables are about God's agenda for all lives in his kingdom. Towers are all about my name, my money, my goals, my objectives and dreams, making a name and a kingdom for myself. Tables are all about God's name, his vision, his objectives, dreams for all people who will call on his name. Towers are about selfishness. Tables are about selflessness. Towers are give me what I want. Tables are how can I serve you? Would you like a chair? How about some mashed potatoes? Who are you? I've never seen you before. Welcome. Everybody has a seat at the table. 
Towers are about having your say. Tables are about God having his say into every single area of every single life. Towers are all about what we can do. Tables are all about what God will do through his people. And that's a tall order. It's a tall order that God demands. Will you help me? Will you help me build this table? Please. Will we never settle down and we say that's enough? That we're so frustrated with empty chairs that we want to break out the latch and make the table bigger so that everyone who hasn't come into the banquet would come in. Will you help me? Will you help me do that? Will you help me to resist building a tower to our name and build a table to the name of Christ? Never forsaking what we truly believe, that there's only one name under the heavens by which we are called to be saved, and that's Jesus Christ and him alone. But we realize that it'll take some people some time to get there. And so everybody has a seat at the table. Which mentality do you have? If it's a tower mentality, you're all about safety, security, non-sacrificial, protective of your wants and needs, stay in rather than go out, feelings of superiority, consumer type, comfortable type of person. But if you're table mentality, you have this desire to go out, to leave safety and security behind, to hold firm to your beliefs but not with superiority. You don't talk down to people, you talk across. And above everything else, this is how you live. Luke 14, 23. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads into the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Which one are you? And if you're tower, will you have the courage? What happens to every tower eventually? It comes crashing down. The table of God will last forever. If you're a tower person, become a table one. Do something in your life this week that would exhibit you really are a table guy or girl so that there'd be a fully devoted follower of Jesus in every home in the valley. Father, thank you for the passion that you showed in pursuing us. And I pray for our church and our people that we would lose our tower mentality of building up, but rather we'd want to build out. We'd spread out the table knowing that everything that happens around this table ultimately is what every individual in life is looking for. Love, acceptance, hope, significance, security for the future. Father, help us to be so inviting that everybody's invited back for seconds and thirds. And even when they don't measure up to what we think they ought to be, that we would take a good look and recognize how only in moving into relationship with them will we able, be able to become the people that we're called to be through the friction and pressure of life conformed to the image of your Son. In his name we pray. Amen.